<laughs> now, my question for you, and my question for Mike Johnson, who's going to be our guest, NHL on TSN analyst, longtime NHLer, over 600 games, five NHL teams. My question is, if you plug your toilet at a hotel, shouldn't it be the hotel's responsibility to plunge that toilet? Hmm. It's not an Airbnb. <laughs> it's not an Airbnb. It's a hotel. Okay, so you saw... Something happens, what, you fix it. What did you do? I, I grabbed the plunger. I wasn't going to let it <laughs> fester. <laughs> I mean, what could I do? Uh, that is baffling. I can't believe that they... But they probably... The guy probably looked at what you did in there, and he's like, I'm not touching this. Yeah, you're probably right. You're probably right. He probably did that. But that's wrong. Why wouldn't you have called down instead of walked down? Well, because I was walking down anyway. But I knew I was leaving, Then you right? don't have to put your, your face associated with your, your debacle in the toilet, so you just call down and say, Hello. Yeah, I could have done that. But I don't think it would have made a difference. They still would have come up, plopped a bucket and a plunger in front of my room and let me deal with it myself. Have you ever experienced this, Mike? how do you feel about this? You've you've traveled so much. You've played so many places. (laughs) Well. (laughs) Welcome to the show, Mike. Thanks for having me. (laughs) That's fantastic. Walked into this one, didn't I? (laughs) Yeah, we were talking about weird stuff. I'm going with Dano. You got to call down. And that's 100%. The hotel's responsibility yes, to take care of that. That is not on you. That's what you pay the room <laughs> rate per night for. for. Exactly. So you plunge it in this, put the bucket in, then plunge it back in oh, the hall? My. Yes. <laughs> because, I because I I maintain it was a normal bowel movement and that it was something previous to me. The person who stayed in that room before me had almost plugged it up, and I just put the cherry on top, so to speak. Well, you're trusting for the hotel to have industrial strength. Kind pipes of. to, to yeah. deal with whatever That's comes right. up. It shouldn't be like 100-year-old pipes like the ones in my old house. Uh, yeah. anyway. You know what? I'm just going to start going on the road again. And um, yeah, Think, think of me. I'm hoping this doesn't come up. Think uh, of me every time you have so a So we were thing. discussing Jay at a trip to Chicago. He saw Billy Joel at Wrigley. Have you ever seen a concert at Wrigley? No, not a concert. I've been to baseball games there. Okay. Uh, but never a concert. I'm not a massive concert guy. Oh, really? What was no. the last concert? Yeah, well, what's the last one you went to? That's a very good question. So long ago, I probably can't even remember it. Remember what it might be. Um, what about you? Maybe you took your daughters to a show or oh, something? Oh, yes, yes. I've seen Taylor Swift. Oh, I've there seen you go. One Direction. That Swizzle. counts. One Direction. Yeah. Taylor Swift supposedly puts on a really good show. Yeah. She does. She does. Yeah. Good show. Yeah. Uh, Bruno yeah. Mars is coming to town. They didn't go see Bruno Mars, but they saw... One Direction. I remember somebody, I was at One Direction. My daughters were 12 and 8, or 10 and 8. And somebody chirped me on Twitter. It's like, I see Mike Johnson dancing to One Direction. I'm like, I'm holding my 8-year-old's hand. Come yeah. on now. See, yeah. Dan's going to have to deal with that. You can't be doing that to me. And I'm going to have to deal with that someday. I, but I might uh, I might get Bruno Mars tickets because I actually know I would like to go see sons. him. Yeah, he put on a great show. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. he's all right. How was Billy Joel? He was great, but I was saying the sound was garbage. But Wrigley's not built for concerts. Not new, and so the acoustics are probably not ideal. It's, there's none. <laughs> yeah, there's it no just acoustics. goes into the air. Yeah. yeah. Like so, and it's literally windy as hell that night. <laughs> it's the Windy City. So Where do they play? Like a, right, the right outfield, at Wrigley. So they base? set up uh, right in the outfield. They set up a massive stage in the outfield, and then everyone's sort of, that way it's sort of a bowl, right? right. But, but it's still, the sound was crap. Now, I actually heard, and someone told me that they saw Pearl Jam there, because Eddie Vedder's from of course. there. And that they were great. But I could see, because at one point they did a cover of Layla, Billy Joel yeah. and his band, and it was really good, and it sounded the best of the night. So I almost wonder if, like, if you're going to rock in it, maybe it would be all night, it would be better sound, I suppose. Just power through. I did, don't know. Did you have a favorite NHL city in which... Uh, a- to visit where you're like, oh, man, I can't wait. We're going to like have some time to spend here. I can't wait to get there. Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think the Canadian cities are always fun. So Vancouver, you can't go wrong. Right. Yeah. Um, it's a you know, great city. How many times have you been the Roxy in Vancouver? I made the audit. You know what? When, we, when was the last <laughs> time I was there? When I was there a couple years ago, I'm like, I haven't been to the Roxy in, I, <laughs> since the finals of 2011. Right. And so I'm like, I'm going. Yeah. I don't care if anyone's coming with me. I'm going. But I'm going to blast from the past. And uh, yeah, you know what? Still still rocking. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, still I've been going. there on occasion. Yes. Uh, Vancouver, Montreal is always great. And now 
that I've spent more time in the States. Um, Chicago, always, mm-hmm. yes. always at the top of the list. Always the the rookie dinners are always in Chicago, aren't they? Like well, steakhouses you know, and yeah. stuff? Well, the rookie dinners are kind of determined based on your schedule. So okay. you need kind of two full days off right. because you need a day to recover <laughs> right. from the rookie meal, uh, which is why when I played in Arizona, we could count on at least – a half dozen games a year where we had a good chance because the other team had their rookie meal. Right. Like they were at the rookie meal hangover <laughs> right. game. And we're like, yes, here we go, boys. We got them right where we want them. Um, but yeah, Miami, New York, LA, Chicago. What was the biggest tab you've ever seen at a rookie meal? Oof. Okay. I'll go. So my last year, um, I was playing in St. Louis. St. Louis, right. And so I got hurt, had shoulder surgery in maybe January. And the team was coming to play in Montreal and I was recovering in Toronto. And so I'm like, you know what? I'll go to Montreal to see them. I haven't seen the guys in a while. And they were having the rookie dinner there. Perfect. Oh so boy. timing was worked out well oh for me. Oh, God. So I went to, uh, and so Coup it was my last Cheval. year. No, it was, uh, I can't remember what the name of the restaurant was. <laughs> but somehow, when I was flying, I don't think I stayed for the game. I just went to the rookie dinner and went home the morning <laughs> of the game. <laughs> true, nice. true story. I love and, it. And I got a text at the airport, 9 in the morning, and not feeling great. And it's like, check out the cover of the Journal de Montréal oh, or whatever no. it was. La Presse. La Presse, whatever it might have been. And <laughs> oh, it God. had the tab. And how much? It's terrible to say. It's almost terrible to say. <laughs> no. 57? Yes. I thought it was. I thought it'd be closer to like 80. Okay, 57, not that's bad. Insane. That's insane. That's a lot of food. $57,000. And... Yes. Yes. <laughs> like, that's so insane. To say it out loud what's, yeah. the tip, what's the tip on that? Well, I'm sure the bill was 45, and they tipped yeah. like 12 tipped or something. Them. Wow. 12. But you, like, Good night. You think of all the better ways to spend $60,000, yeah. which is a conversation. Like, even my mom will, like, you shouldn't do that, Michael. I'm like, well, I mean, <laughs> it's not really me, and it's just kind of a thing. I'm just going along why with everybody. Give, why don't you give it to charity? I'm like, but guys do give money to charity. Yeah. I mean, you can do both. Yeah, I mean, right. you can be... You know, that's why it's a, a best that people citizen, don't know the numbers, which right? Which is why I violated the code by telling. No, no, it was on the front page of the paper. It was in the so paper. That one so was, was okay, but that it was the highest as it was my last year. It was. Uh, you have played up. on a lot of. You first of all, you played in a lot of interesting cities. You mentioned Arizona, so you played like warm weather cities: Arizona, mm-hmm. Phoenix, and Tampa, and then you played in St. Louis, a city that weirdly every NHL player seems to love, but me. Oh, you didn't love it. You weren't there for that long. No. You just didn't love it. Like, what didn't you like about it? Uh, mostly because the hockey didn't go great. You right. Know, was, I was there for 40 games. I played 20. It's the first time I'd ever been a healthy scratch. So right. Kind of miserable to begin with. Um, but it was very much, at that point, I'd come to the Midwestern sensibility is true. They're nice people, yeah. kind of a slower pace. But um, I, I'd come to enjoy places where there is some sort of life some sort of culture downtown right and it was a midwestern town where people worked downtown then everyone went to the suburbs right and like ghost town at 6 p.m right nothing down there um and so i, I guess i'm just not a s- straight suburb kind of guy got it. i'm more of an urban guy so um yeah and, and mostly because the hockey but you're right i mean it's amazing how many people want to retire there they have the biggest alumni in America that live in Coley Akabo last week was like yeah. my our, my wife and I are talking about going back. Yeah, there. like jeez, okay, like people I just would, love it. Yeah, there. and I wouldn't make. Yeah, that not not you. No, You're not, not doing me, that. No. When you play hockey in Arizona, obviously you can you can golf year round. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like guys are judging you if you golf too much? They're like, oh, this guy golfing again. <laughs> yes, <laughs> true, <laughs> but true true story. True story. We we would we're playing a year in Arizona, and we were not. Doing well. <laughs> Tough to decide what year that might have been. But, um, and I think they'd maybe made a coaching change. Maybe they'd fired Bobby Francis. And so our rink was, as well reported, well out in Glendale, 45 in a drive for everybody was living. So the last, you know, from January on, we basically were having optionals. So like, you know, don't worry about driving the 45 <laughs> minutes in the morning. Just come ready to play. So there was a group of like four guys that got in the habit of playing nine holes the morning of the game. Right. That was their kind of pregame warm up. Yeah. Did not go over well. Ooh. Not one of them made it to the trade deadline. All four of them were traded. Wow. Yeah. And was this something like that was gradually found out over time? Yeah, I, I think. Just word got out. I think somehow. word got around, and I think 
in a fit of anger, one of the coaches was like, if you guys go golfing in the morning of the game one more time, I swear to God, I got it. <laughs> and sure enough, they all they all were dealt because of it. So, um, but like we had Grant Fuhr as our goalie coach. Like wow. that guy was burning rubber out of the out of the practice <laughs> rink to hit the driving oh, range yeah, like TPC. Amazing He's like a professional golfer. golfer. Yeah. So I mean, the the coaches like to do it more than anyone. I lived on a golf course there. It was the one place I bought a house. I didn't play golf ever. The only time I played golf was my friends came down <laughs> or visitors. Yeah. Like I never played during. So the you year. never seems, got to play with Alice Cooper. It seems like in no, Phoenix, he's actually shockingly. Yeah, like not off like golf. Like he oh, looks he's like great. He would break if he swung a club. Oh no, he's great. No, he I said know. golf saved his life. And you, yeah, yeah. And you could always tell the teams that you played when they were in Arizona because you'd come, they'd come in the game, and just sunburned so badly. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, it was, I always remember the Detroit's because all the Scandinavians were just so red. Their, their <laughs> faces pasty. and their necks were. And so of course the chippier players, not like myself, but they'd love to. To grab the jersey and like tug to try to give him the, the collar burn on the neck because it hurt particularly bad, fresh off a bad sunburn. Yeah, that was that is uh, hilarious. Yeah, it's hard to hide when you spend seven hours in the sun in Arizona. Will hockey ever work there? Um, well, I mean, it works in Vegas. Yeah, but but it's completely they, different. It is different Why? though, isn't it? Because but, I mean, like, if you got the rink in the right spot, right, yeah, and that's had a good problem, team, right? then you know. You do okay. I mean, they, they just miscalc. I get why they put the rink in the middle of nowhere because someone paid them to do it. Yeah. But if they got the rink in the right spot and had a good team, they'd be all right because you think about it. How many, football aside, because football is almost a bit of an aberration, but of baseball, basketball, and hockey, how many bad teams in America sell out? Well, the Yankees would, the yep. Knicks would, the Red, Red Sox, Sox would, yep. the Lakers Cubbies, might, Lakers, Cubs. Yeah. But like, the big classic teams Rangers with massive might, fan bases. But, and when know, they're bad, Milwaukee's then not selling out. No, you're right. You're right. You know? But that's uh, you brought up Vegas, Mike. Let's well, let's get, see how Vegas does when they're when they have a bad team. Yeah. yeah. Let's see how many people are going to those games. Because yeah, that's maybe they still are. Maybe casinos are giving away tickets. What everyone thought in the beginning that was going to happen. But everyone's like, oh, such a good fan base. Okay. Well, let's just, yeah, get, let's exactly. See. Carolina had a good fan base when they won the cup. <laughs> Precisely. And now they they're drawing flies. So. Uh, you know, F- Florida might be the only team. Like, you forget, when I started in the NHL in the late 90s, Washington was awful. Like, cavernous, empty tumbleweeds. Right. Chicago, awful. Pittsburgh, awful. And now those are, like, the class organizations of the league. So, you know, it's all very cyclical. The only team I don't remember really ever playing in front of a full house is Florida. Like, I had, yeah. like at no point... Did I ever play in a game in Florida? And be like, oh yeah, rock it tonight. <laughs> like it just it never, <laughs> never happened. Yeah. They tarp off the upper bowl. You're oh, like, what God, is going? It, so it feels it feels minor league. Unfortunately, you you talk to current players now. What's their take on Vegas? Have you heard horror stories? Guys going there, and you're like, oh man, I don't know if I can go back there. Or did they just lock themselves in their rooms? How do they handle the Vegas experience? Um, I, I, somewhere in between. Like guys are professional, and you, you know the idea that goat guys going in Vegas the night before a game is not you know out to the club at four in the morning and drinking and whatever partying it up. It's just they might be at a show or at a concert or you know dinner at ten or maybe they play they gamble a little bit. It's just a little bit different, not off the rails different. Okay. Um, but yeah, I heard some stories of some guys who you know a little <laughs> bit. I mean, because most a lot of NHL players have been to Vegas. But you haven't been to Vegas with your team, yeah, with your boys, yeah, in the middle of the season. Everyone, Especially if things are going things good, are going and you good have a couple of days off. And you after. think the first six weeks, yeah, we're going into Vegas expansion team. Here we go, boys. Have <laughs> yeah. a good night. Pick up two points, and on we go. <laughs> that, that never happened. So I, I, like everyone, I'll be curious to see what happens to Vegas this year. I wonder if the novelty will be off for the visitors. That the Vegas flu will be not as widespread as it was last year, and I wonder if that matters at all. Um, so you played in Toronto and Montreal as well. Mm-hmm. Well, which which experience is best for you? You're a Toronto guy. It's it's. I, I don't want to sit on the fence. So Toronto was very neat for me from Scarborough. You know, I came straight from school. I never knew anything about pro sports. My parents, my siblings, my buddies, everyone got to take part. Yeah, and it was really neat. And it's we had a good neat. team. Yeah. Right. You know, we got to the conference final in '99. I did relatively well, so all this talk about 
the downside of Toronto. I didn't really experience it because, generally speaking, I overachieved because my expectations were so low. Right. So, um, yeah, I, I loved playing for the Leafs. So, I, I don't know. I almost have to discount it because I'm from here. It was right. so unique because I'm from here. But I loved Montreal. Next most of anywhere else I played, I would have stayed. They didn't want me. But, <laughs> um I only played one year, but I, I loved it. I lived right downtown. I didn't live out in the suburbs and paid a fortune for some rental. But it was it was great. Um, people love their hockey there. Yeah. And you, it, but it's a fun town. It's a big, small town or a small, big town. Yeah. Like you, Cosmopolitan. Yeah. Lots of stuff going on. You are on. now on the other side of the camera. Since you played in both those cities with the emergence of social media and podcasts and blah, whatever, how many more media members are there in those rooms? Yeah. Like 50 more, 100 more? Like Yeah, so maybe back in Toronto when it was super busy late 90s, there would have been 20 people in the room. Right. Right? You know, yeah, because... The Sun guys, PSN the Star been, guys. You know, the only sports network at that time. And yeah. there was a like global and a couple of papers. Or Sportsnet might have just been Sportsnet starting just up. starting up. So yeah. there's probably 100, 100, like... 40 to 50 on now. And then Montreal was bigger because it's it's not quite as big in either language, but with both languages, it becomes bigger yeah. than it was in Toronto. Um, so it would be different, but that wouldn't be the hard part. Like when you're at the rink, whether I'm talking to a scrum of three or a scrum, scrum of 12, you're just, you talk your five minutes and on you go. The difference would be in the, the, the loss in of anonymity. Right. Yeah. Just in day-to-day life. Yeah. Like, but didn't you find that Montreal, like you said it, like they love that team so much? Did you find when you went out? Yeah, like, but it was all very polite. But it was good. And, and like, you know, it wasn't like my parents couldn't log on and say, oh, here's Mike having dinner. Or here's yeah. Mike at the bank. Or here's Mike at the bar. Like, you know, <laughs> things. Here's Mike at Chez Paris. <laughs> well, I mean, at one of the teams I used to play for in Canada, <laughs> Toronto, um, <laughs> you know, occasionally guys, after, when we practiced at Maple Leaf Gardens way back, Yes. Some guys would go to an establishment for lunch after practice. Sure, yeah. It was a thing. And I'm like, it's so gross to think that that was a destination to eat. <laughs> Zanzibar? Are we talking about well, Zanzibar? North. Oh, yeah. oh, Brass Rail? Yeah. Yes. When it had food on the menu. Yeah. And it was like, it was a... <laughs> Wait, they don't serve food anymore? No. Bo- no? No, I don't think so. I think they'll microwave you a pizza. Oh, <laughs> that's almost what we were getting back. It was like a bi-weekly thing. Guys I would love ro- it. roll up there and sit down at... <laughs> 12.30 for a steak sandwich. It's so terrible. I love it. But you could do that, and yeah, and there wasn't a problem. So, um, you know. Yeah, probably not, couldn't do that now. You probably wouldn't get away with that now. You probably wouldn't want to. I'm not sure I wanted it back then. But just, you know, just general stuff like that would could be taxing if if you have kids and you're at the playground and, you know, people are taking, you know, or you're dropping off at school or trick-or-treating. And, you know, just different things that come up in general life and, um so much great about playing those big markets, but that might be one part that might wear on you after a while. I have some players here mm-hmm. that you played with over the course of your career. Is this research? What are you doing right now? I, it's the only research I've ever done. <laughs> First time for everything. <laughs> uh, you've played with a lot of really awesome players and interesting players. Yep. Like, so I'm just going to start with one that just I forgot that you played with. Alex Kovalev. Boom. What yeah. was that guy like? So... Give us like a, a quick summary of Kovalev. He was the Dos Equis man before Dos Equis existed. <laughs> like he was the most interesting man in the world. Right. He flew. He flew his own plane, and he had you know spoke multiple languages and this you know the Russian Eastern European flavor, and I, I really really liked him as a person. And to this day, I remember we had like our secret Santa thing, and he got me, and he gave me like a hand engraved. Russian flask. I still have it. It's the coolest thing of all time. I would never have something like that. <laughs> right. And so I got nothing but respect for him. And I don't even bag on guys who are immensely talented and maybe don't try as hard as some other guys. Like, right. whatever. Everyone's wired different. I probably didn't try as hard as Sidney Crosby tries. What are you going to do? Yeah. Can't hold it against me. No, not everyone's Sidney Crosby. <laughs> right. So it's not even that. But this is my other Kobe instinct. So the good stuff, then the bad stuff. In Montreal, I played on the third line from the first day of camp. Every single day. Radic Bonk, Alexander Perijogan. Every single day. We never got split apart. Never got on the power play. And I'm like, I had always been on the power play. I'd always played top six. And and so I was desperate to get in the top six. So finally, one of the upper lines was struggling or whatever. And they put me playing with Thomas Plakanitz and Alex Kovalev. 
And I'm like, okay, this is it. I gotta have a game because it's, I'm, I'm, it's my spot. Finally, December. I've been waiting two months for this. And it was a night that Kobe was having a relaxing time out there. Is that he, the night where he got slashed in the hand? No, yeah, right. He played like he got slashed in his legs. Like he, he just wasn't. He wasn't engaged. And I, it all culminated in the second period, first period. And I tried to throw a cross ice pass to him. It was a little bit ahead of him because I thought he was going to be going a bit quicker. But it's okay. It's off the boards. <laughs> And he could skate into it. And it bounced off the boards, and he just stood upright. And he, and he, <laughs> he gave me the double look across like, what are you doing, kid? That's not on my tape. I swear to God, I never played with him. I never shift again. Like, I got pulled to the third line that moment. <laughs> like, straight off oh the ice, God. off the power play. And I'm like, Kobe, That's come on. Cool. You're killing One me. Game. One game I need you to play, and he wasn't having it. So... Um, you know, I see fans could have a see a moment like that and get, but I, I really quite liked him. Yeah. But that moment, yeah. That kind of sums him up, though, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. You know, because you saw the skill and everything, but then you're right. Yeah, you and he saw was a lot sick. Nice his stuff. hand, like his skill was. Yeah, he was gross. insane. Yeah. Um, Saku Koivu. You played yeah, Sak. I mean, really neat guy. I mean, I didn't know anything about him. Probably one of the greatest moments the last 30 years in the NHL was his first game back. Oh, yeah, the, the visual sure. of him on the Crazy. on the blue line with the still no hair and um, really, I, I, I quite liked him. Uh, really, and a, and a good leader. The only captain in my entire life, certainly NHL career, that gave the you know raw raw speech that like resonated. Right. It, everyone it, else, it was like everyone oh. else, like. Oh. Can you finish up? We got. I need a Gatorade. <laughs> like you know, but this guy and and again, I wasn't particularly tied to him. It was you know, we just I'd just been there a few months. But when he stood up the one time, and it was just like, yeah, yeah, so, you know, yeah. it was it got you going. So um, yeah, a lot of respect for him. He was and a, and a good captain, good teammate, um, and dealt with a lot of stuff in Montreal well. And that's like you know, I think of him, like a Matt's the captains. Yeah, like dealing with that stuff, he dealt with it well. Did so, you ever have a captain who gave a speech where people? <laughs> laughed. Um, <laughs> not, people just couldn't hold it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe I'm, later. I might give like Jay a look across the room, like, hmm, are you hearing what I'm hearing? And you're you're this close, buddy. Me. But um, yeah, no, I, there was some moments that, you, and didn't even have to be a captain doing. Like maybe some other would, guy would pipe up and think it was his moment to give his best Newt Rockney, and you're like, no, man. No. <laughs> it's, not, it's not working for you today. God, I wish I could be... I wish we could have a whole show of those moments. Oh, it would be priceless. Um, Claude Lemieux you played with in Phoenix. Yeah, Pep. Um, so, Pep was a different cat. Um, <laughs> he broke my... In Jersey, he broke my orbital bowl, and I still have the dent in it on purpose with a stick. Well, that's not I took nice. the puck off him, he turned around and towed it over and like... Wow. Just... Broke my right in my eye. I wasn't my visor or anything. It was like this far from my eye, and I'm like, this guy's. A, I don't know if I can swear on this podcast. Oh, yeah, but I'm like, can. this yeah. guy's a jerk. Yeah. But then he's like, he's not, he's not so bad. Um, but he was, he was in a tough spot at that point in his career because he was brought in to be great in the playoffs. Yes. He didn't always. make the playoffs that often. Right. So it was kind of a not a great fit, except for the one year. We make the playoffs, and I was playing on a good line at that point. I was playing with, uh, what was it? Maybe Ladislav Nagy and Damon Lanko. Lanko. And, and, and we'd finished the year well, last 25 games, like every game together. And we got to the playoffs, and the coach was like, yeah, I'm putting Pep on that line. I'm like, oh, brutal. What, what for? Because well, well, that's what he's here for. I'm yeah. like, what am I here for? <laughs> he's like, well, you haven't won a Conn Smythe. I'm like, true. <laughs> so, so we played San Jose in the playoffs, and I'm like, right back to the third line. I'm like, what is this nonsense? Oh, man. And... Uh, yeah, I think it lasted two games with Pep up there, and then he. Why the nickname Pep? Did I? Pepe Lemieux. Pepe oh, Pepe Lemieux. Lemieux. Okay. From, um, from this guy. And then you played with Roenick there. Yeah. So, <laughs> first, it, first thought for Jr. was, I pulled into the practice rink and I was walking in the back door with my bag, and I'm looking at the cars and like Arizona's nice cars. Like there's some cities have nice cars, Canadian ones aren't aren't them because the the weather. But so I'm checking out all the cars. They're amazing. And one says on the license plate, Styles 97. I'm like, wow, <laughs> that's aggressive. That is so aggressive for a personalized license plate like that. Um, so I'm like, okay, this is JR. But if, same thing, I'm like, and this guy's going to be a bit, of a, a, bit of a, a bit of a douche. You know what I mean? Like, just full of himself. But he wasn't. He first, he one of the first yeah. guys, like, listen, Mike, you need anything. 
you call me, you need a place to stay, you right. stay at my house, you need a car, you need a phone, like anything you need, um, family issues, like just call me, I'll, I'll take care of it. Now, we only, we're on the team for like two weeks together, but right. um, yeah, he was, he was good. Now, the introduction to him was not as good as the introduction to uh, Big Walt, Keith Kachuk. Oh, yeah, I was just going to ask you about Kachuk. So, Keith Kachuk, we get through the first practice, go to my first game. Old America West rink. I'm walking. I'm at this point. I'm 27 or eight. I'm like six, five years in my NHL. I'm not a kid. Right. So he's walk. I walk in the dressing room for the game, and we're kind of getting ourselves organized. He's like, he's wearing a robe, like a terry cloth robe that says Walt, Big Walt on it. <laughs> and you know, he's walking around. He's got his feet up on the couch, oh, and he's God. like, kid, kid. I, I'm like. Are you talking to me? Like I'm, <laughs> I'm almost thirty, sir. Um, I think you're four years older than me. Like we're almost the same age. Like kid, come here. Like, hey, what's up, Keith? He's like, um, it's Walt. I'm like, oh, okay, okay. He's we're like, playing this big game, Walt. I'm like, okay. And I'm not, and I'm not sure if he's kidding or not. Right. But he's just like, so um, just before we get going, two rules on this team. Always pass the puck to seven is rule number one. <laughs> and, and like he's saying it, kind of tongue in cheek. But maybe not. And he's like, and the second rule, don't you ever forget rule number one. <laughs> and then he turned and walked away. And I'm like, what? Did, what? And I'm happened? looking at everyone else like, is that a thing? Is that a shtick? Is he, <laughs> is he getting me? Is he punking me? Is Ashton Kutcher coming out? <laughs> That's oh, awesome. man. And he was also an amazing guy. Really? Yeah. yeah. Another guy, it, almost across the board, guys that I thought I would not like, just because they're per- what I perceive them to be as yeah. players. Were generally some of the guys I like the most. Right, Matt Barnaby. No. I was just gonna ask you about you Barnaby. You about I have Barnaby. look, yeah. look. It's on there, oh, Barnaby. Right. Yeah, Barnaby. Because I, yeah, I, I didn't realize he played with you in Tampa. Tampa right? Yeah, yeah. Barnaby and Ronick, we would say the same things yeah. too, because we both have worked with Barnaby, and we've also seen Ronick at various Around, events, yeah. and we saw him at the Olympics, and we always sit down and have a chat with him. Yeah, he's yeah. always good to us. I think I have a theory about Ronick, though. He wants to be loved. He doesn't. Well, who doesn't, he, Jay? No, I know, but he really does. You know, like he doesn't want anyone in the room to not like him. So he's good to everybody. Yeah. Well, he was good to me the, the couple weeks we played together, and he's good to me now. Like, you know, I work at NBC on occasion, and we cross paths. Yeah, he's always great he's, to us. He's been he's fantastic. Awesome. Do you so. ever look into his eyes while he's saying something on NBC, and you're like, "Where are you going with this?" Because I do it when I'm watching at home. Because I'm like, I don't know how he's going to... Okay, brought it around Where's he going to pull this one out of face? Yeah. He's, this one's going off the rails. No, he saved it. But, he, but but when he played, he was so good in post-game clips that I think he doesn't try maybe as hard now. Is that... Would you uh, say that's a fair I have not assessment? been in the studio with him, so I can't say how hard he tries or prepares. But, um, you know, he's got... His personality oh, it's is... so amazing. Is, is, uh, one of his strongest. Do you attributes. But, do you but, have a memorabilia shrine at home? No, no. I literally have no nothing. I have You're one of those guys because it's one or the other. Yeah, There's no yeah. in between. I have my first goal puck on the wall in my office. I have maybe my all rookie team plaque or something on the wall. Maybe I don't know. Gets hit by the closet door all the time. <laughs> somewhere I won like I won the rookie of the year for the sporting news. It's a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> it's At like the, the time, it's sporting like the news is big. Um, yeah. But anyway, it's like an Oscar. So it looks neat. Mm. So I have that maybe I in my office. That so that's it. That's only in my office. There's not one other thing related to hockey anywhere in my house. Okay. Let's go back to Barnaby. Yeah. So good guy, you're saying, uh, when you played with him. So, yeah. And kind of like soft-spoken off the ice. Really? And yet still Top. kind of insane on the ice. Right. Like the t- those guys, it yeah. seems, again, across the board. Yeah, those kind of guys but he insane was on the ice. On the ice, because he was kind of crazy. Oh, he yeah. was like, insane. insane. Like, yeah. Not just the googly eyes, but just <laughs> you know the things he did and the, 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 the in the middle of the fights and all the stuff. And, he yeah. and Theo Fleury, I would put in the same category because oh. I've asked that about Fleury. Like we've met him a few times. Yeah. I'm like, you were insane. He's like, yeah, I yeah. was a bit crazy on the in day. Arizona. Theo Fleury, sidebar, we were playing uh, the Rangers, and I think he was going through a bit of a tougher time in the, that, that, those years. And he was late in the game. And he, he got frustrated. We were winning. Got kicked out of the game. And back then, our dressing room was kind of like, like kitty corner to there. So they had to change and walk in behind our lounge to the, where their clothes were. And so we got off the. And all of a sudden, we hear a commotion in the hallway. And it's see, like it's like a horde of angry, stampeding men <laughs> going down the hallway. It's just Theo, just breaking everything. 
and there the the Phoenix Suns practice rink or rink uh, uh, court, court. Were, was right there, like right, sunk it down. Right, he's breaking the glass Jeez. like that. Was looking into it. He, there's a payphone for some reason. He knocked the payphone <laughs> off. So old we are. He wanted the money. Yeah, wanted like, the it, quarters. It, he, he took a fountain off the off the wall. Jeez. Like everything. It was. Ew. You're like, what's happening out there? And then it was just <laughs> quick. Shut the door. Get back inside. You played with Wendell too. Wendell Clark. Wendell Clark was my first roommate. Jesus, uh, when I got to true like my first what? camp. How's that? You're a Toronto kid. Yeah, I played with him on my first game. Jeez. He Did you just kneel next to his bed and watch him sleep? <laughs> so, well, for, first, <laughs> my first game, I show up to play, and I'd not met anyone. They had, they had an optional skate, so nobody was there. I went to the game, and I'm people are kind of looking at me like it's March. Team's not doing well. They don't even know. There's on Twitter. Like nobody knows what I what I'm doing there. Like who's right. this guy? Like, <laughs> like Larry Murphy no- literally sat down with me at. Hall of Famer Larry Murphy at pregame meal. And he's like, uh, so would you win a contest? He thought I was like, <laughs> have a day with the Leafs from Molson. I'm like, no, man, I'm playing. He's like, oh, all right then. Like, just so typical <laughs> Murphy. Like, no big so deal. you win a contest? <laughs> Dude, Larry uh, Murphy. So I'm sitting there before the game, and I'm nervously, I don't know who I'm playing with. And like they have a whole bunch of guys in that team I'd not heard of, like Freddie Modine and Jason Smith and Steve Sullivan and Todd Warner and... Marcel, like all kinds of guys. I never heard of them. So they write down Sundin, Barazin, and I don't know whoever else, Jonas Hoagland, whoever else the first liner was. <laughs> and they write down Clark, 17, 11 was Steve Sullivan, and 20. I was given number 20. And I'm like, so I, I anxiously, like a child, look to Wendell Clark for approval. Like somehow it's <laughs> like, is this going to be okay with you? <laughs> and, and, and so no joke, he's like stifling a yawn. <laughs> it's, it's Tampa in February. It's like just another night. It's the biggest moment of my life, and he could not be less interested. So then I quickly, I'm like not getting out of the thing, out of him. I turn to Sully, who is I still think younger than I am. He might be 21, and he's looking at me with like the cut eye, like so disappointed that he's saddled with this rookie with from college. And I'm like. <laughs> Like shaking his head in disgust. <laughs> At that point, he had 34 games under his belt, and he's got no time for me. We laugh about it all the time now, because oh, we got he got a goal and an assist. I got an assist. I got cut for 10 stitches. It all worked out fine. But <laughs> that was my Wendell first game, and then the next year in training camp, it was probably the only time in the last 20 years I played hockey that I had to make a team, because I was on a two-way contract. There was no guarantees. I had to make it. I'd only played 13 games the year before, so I was very nervous. I'd never been to training camp. I wasn't one of those kids from who's been drafted. Had been to five of them. So I'm paired up with Wendell, and like a good Boy Scout, like I go back from the rink and I just kind of sit around. I go to dinner at 5:30 and <laughs> I'm back in the room. And every night Wendell would roll it, roll out of his bed at like 9:45. Come for dinner, kid. <laughs> <I'm> like, dinner. <laughs> I ate four hours ago. <laughs> I'm like, where were you going for dinner? <laughs> Steak. <laughs> every night. Every steak. night. He went for 10 o'clock steak every night. <laughs> yes. And I'd that be like amazing. sound asleep. He'd walk back in at a midnight or something. And I'd have been asleep for two hours. I don't know if we spoke for 10 minutes that whole t- week. But I've already eaten. But <laughs> yeah, that's what, that's what, I, sound, that's what I still sound like to <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. Uh, yeah. Um, oh my god. We've got to go great. do TV now with you. Yeah. Yeah. That's the end. I could talk to you about oh, uh, yeah. your career I, all day. I man. always have to ask one goalie question. Best goalie you ever played with? Oh, that's it. That's a good. One. Uh, Dominic Hasek by miles. Okay. He was yeah. just. Oh man. Just tell us. Just the, <laughs> yeah. just give us a snippet of that guy. Oh, uh, if I could do. See, I'm not good at impersonations. <laughs> just right. Give the. Uh, okay. Dominic so Hasek here's my here's my. Dominic. Dominic. This good. actually happened. It was a TSN game when he was playing for Ottawa. And Ray Emery was his backup. Mm-hmm. And he his back, Hashik's back was effed. So we had him mic'd up. We had Hashik mic'd up in the warm-up skate. And so, uh, you know, Cuthbert's like, all right, I think we got some... Uh we got, we got some information from Dominic Hashik. And it cuts to them. And it's the two of them skating around, Hashik and Emery. And Hashik comes up behind him. He's like, Razor. <laughs> Razor. My back. <laughs> Razor, you're in my back. 
<laughs> that's, that's it. That's, that's all he it. said. That's not bad. Because that's, that's very accurate. That's very accurate. And he'd, he'd go in front of the net, and he would just go in that accent. Masi, masi. It's like he's doing an NBC commercial. Masi. Like, although he was he was a little squirrely because I... When he was in Buffalo, great goaltender. You didn't know what he was doing. He was a just... little. He got in a fight in a um, in a road hockey game. Yeah. Well, this, <laughs> so he was. They were doing a team picture in Buffalo, well, and time. he kind of had the curly, toughly hair, or whatever. Yeah. So one of the guys was like was calling him Kramer from Seinfeld. Right. And the guys thought it was funny. Dom did not. No. Oh. That player came into the dressing room and found his pants. To bring it full circle, back where the plunger would go. Right down, he put his to- pants in a toilet. <laughs> in a used toilet. Oh. Jeez, Ashik. Wow. Let's get Cup Crazy 2000. <laughs> and needless to say, the guy almost went to fight Hashik over that. Wow. But the team couldn't let him because he's Hashik. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, he was protected. But anyway, so he was an intense competitor. <laughs> I guess and so. a very good goalie. I guess so. Wait, second favorite. Second best goalie played with. Second best goalie, Cooch. Cujo. Now I played yeah. with him, but you know he you played was, with him twice, kind of. Uh, yes, in Arizona. Right. Look at you did twice, do kind of. Yeah. Yeah, we were in Arizona for one year, but in Toronto specifically, he was. It's the first time I maybe played for a goalie who you're like. He, he made you better. He made you yeah. think you were better than you were. Right. Because mm-hmm. you could screw up, he'd save it. You wouldn't feel bad about yourself, and he <laughs> empower you to go be better because right. you didn't worry about the bad stuff, um, and also. One of the best guys ever. Forget about <laughs> that. He was a goalie who are generally, you know, unique, crazy. Um, yeah, he's he was awesome. So yeah, Cooge was uh, spectacular for those few years. Well, this is awesome. He Mike. got mentioned on last week's podcast, and because Carlo Koliakovo was on, and people said like, I guess he's not a Stephen King fan because Carlo said, yeah, you got to picture some dog on his head. No, like, he said an animal, and he didn't know he didn't realize Cujo was. He didn't book. know that yeah. Cujo was. Well, Carlo's got to be. You now he's doing radio every day. He's got to read a little bit more. I'm just saying. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, this is awesome. I wonder Mike. what former Leaf will be on our podcast. <laughs> With Jeff O'Neill coming on. Jeff O'Neill. Uh, well, that's always a tough one. We keep trying to get him on the TV show, but he won't come and sit over you, in the side seats. You got to do it on a night where he's doing the Leaf panels. Yeah, he's I know. Already well, here. well, I think you're we'll never going to get him to come back. But the problem is, he won't come sit in the side seats because he feels he'll look too fat in the seats. He actually said that. Is there a slimming seat? I don't like. What he is, wants to sit is behind there a seat that desk. Is slimming? Oh, he wants desk. to sit behind us so it hides. Uh, he's way too he, hard on himself. I, I thought I thought he worked out this summer. I, I think, think he's fine. I think he's doing like tweeting out pictures of him doing CrossFit in Collingwood. He's a very sensitive man. Yeah. <laughs> That's what makes him so lovable. I know. And relatable. I, I absolutely yeah. love him, um, man. Mike, this is awesome. Thanks yeah, for anytime. coming on the show, man. This is awesome. I mean, we're gonna head over and do the TV show now. Um, yeah, I guess it's over, Toolsy. Is there anything else to say? Nope, just return a text to my mom. All right. So to Sandra (laughs) and everyone else out there. Never ends. Thanks for listening. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you next week.